and started sharing. Uh, is anyone else sharing their screen? Uh, okay, I'll start sharing again. Okay, can you see my screen again? Is that okay? Grand. Excellent, Prisha. Yes, great. Okay, good. So, um, yeah. So basically, what I'm going to show and um, talk about is testing tools and techniques um, within Azure DevOps and the Power Platform. So um, we had Jordi who's talking about um, unit testing. I'm going to basically be showing how we can um, go a bit further and do not only automated testing but manual testing as well so just to introduce myself my name is trisha sinclair and i work for a partner dxc technology um, but i'm also really heavily involved in the community um, if you have questions that are related to um, devops business driven development spec flow automated testing um, then please get in touch with me if you've got any questions these are my social details i'm on twitter linkedin and i do have a blog where i talk about a lot lots of this stuff as well um, so let's just start so agenda what exactly is testing what are the different types of testing someone previously asked what the difference is in terms of um, fake um, fake XRM easy and um, easy repro. I'm going to cover that. Um, we're also going to go into some of the different testing techniques um, to make testing easier and also cover some of the testing tools that we have available for testing the Power Platform and Dynamics 365. At the end, I'll also share some additional resources which we can then take if we wanted to learn more about any of the things I've talked about. So why should we test? Now, one of the things when we test, the, the main aim of any project is to deliver quality. But what exactly defines quality? Well, quality is not only that um, the customer has a defect-free you know, product, it's also to ensure that what we've delivered to the customer also is what they asked for. So when we test, we can actually ensure that whatever we provide to that customer is free of defects, but also meets their requirements, expectations, okay? So that's the main reason for testing. But when should we start testing? Well, in my opinion, we should test as soon as we can and as often as we can. Um, starting out with those requirements, and this is an area which typically isn't tested. Um, validating requirements will allow not only the project team, that's the developers, that's your testers, um, to confirm that they understand the requirements, that it's free of gaps, um, that it's not ambiguous, um, and also that there are sorry that there are any that, that there aren't any missing um, requirements that they can identify but it also ensures that the business owner themselves understands or the product owner themselves also understand what they're asking for um, once you've all va validated the requirement then what we can actually do is then hand this over to the testing team um, or the developers and developers so they can actually get um, get on with the the whole job of building, okay? So if we don't validate the requirements, this is typically what we end up with. Now, this picture has actually done the rounds. Um, if we, I think we've all seen it a lot in terms of when someone explains something, you tend to hear it in a different way um, than what they actually mean. And if we don't validate the requirements, then what we end up with is pretty much something that looks like this. Um, it's it's not going to meet the expectations of the customer, the needs of the customer. So it's it's really it's really important to understand the the requirements. Okay. So once we've actually understood those requirements, what um what type of testing can we action? Right. So what we just looked at was a framework that we can utilize for both unit testing and integration testing. And a unit testing and integration testing are typically the responsibility of the developers. So with unit testing, what we're doing is we're executing and making sure that the modules that have been built, they, they work in isolation. 
with integration testing, we're ensuring that when we put those modules together, or those methods together, that they still work. OK, so those are the, the developers responsibility and we're ensuring that we need to ensure that they work before we hand it over to a functional tester or a tester. OK, so when we have system testing, this is now where we're doing um, pretty much we're testing above the code. We're just making sure that the requirements match what's been built or the, what's been built matches the requirements. OK, so and then we have regression testing where we're now validating that any new, um, you know, build that's been added has impacted code that's previously been tested and previously been working. And not only that, we then have acceptance testing, which is where now we're sharing information with the customers or the customers are rather creating their own scripts to make sure that what we've now handed over to them matches what their expectations are. And this is typically something that's within the remit of the tester. So what I'm actually going to be focus on, focusing on is more the right hand side of, of this diagram where earlier we had a presentation which more focused on the left hand side of this diagram okay so main thing is making sure that we have what the customer has asked for this is what system testing um, will allow us to do so system testing as i mentioned before really just validates that the requirements that we have equals the build that we're testing. So we don't necessarily need to see the code. We're actually testing the functionality. So here we have an example of a requirement. So here we've got a salesperson. They want to be able to create a new account. And what we have are the acceptance criteria. Now, if we start off by validating the acceptance criteria, there is one missing thing that I would actually add here for removal of any ambiguity, where it says account should be owned by the salesperson. I personally would like that to include owned by the salesperson that created the record because it doesn't explicitly state that, which means that anyone could argue their case either way. OK, so, but if we then were to create a system test, I would want to do this inside of Azure DevOps. Now, Azure DevOps has several different modules. And typically, when we use Azure DevOps, we, we do tend to focus more on pipelines. Um, but there are other modules that are involved that can help with the quality control of the project. The one I'm going to be talking about today is a test module, which is going to be available if you've got a Visual Studio Enterprise license or if you've actually got the test module itself. So let's jump into DevOps. OK, so here we have Azure DevOps. We've got the test plan available there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new test plan. Now, a test plan is pretty much a, um, an, a holding area where I can group together all my different tests. So if I wanted to create uh, just a test plan for today, five DevOps. OK, and I wanted to select the area path. So in my DevOps project, I could have different um, teams that are working towards, um, you know, the towards a build. So different functional teams, and my functional team that I'm going to be creating a test for or test for um, are the D365 sales team that are building within that module. So I'm just going to create a test plan. Create to the test plan. The next thing I want to do is I want to bring in. The requirements that I'm going to be creating tests for. So to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create um, a different, um, create a suite. There are three different suites that we can use. Uh, a static suite basically is where I can manually just specify um, what I'm testing. Um, a query-based suite is where I can search for um, different test cases that already exist in the system. The difference between those two and requirement-based suites is if I use requirement-based suite, it brings back requirements for me to then associate tests to. And this basically allows me to have true traceability, okay? So here I have um, all of my different test cases and I want to bring back all of them in this suite. Um, 
all of the, the tests that are in this area. So I'm going to create a suite. And this is now pulling all the, all the requirements and adding them into this test suite. Now, I mentioned traceability, and that's another reason I personally use test plans in Azure DevOps, because historically, I know a lot of companies use Excel, but when you use Excel, then it's really difficult to confirm um, where a defect lies, and if that defect actually matches up to a requirement to identify if something is truly a defect or a change request. So now that I've associated all the, the test cases, what I want to do is basically show how we can create a test case here. So this is the requirement that I um, mentioned earlier um, that we had in the, ex in the example. And the next thing that I'll do is I'll create a new test case. So create a new test case. I'm just going to click on the test case button and I'm going to specify that I'm going to create a new account. Now, one of the acceptance criteria did mention that I needed to um, test this with multiple test, uh, multiple users or user types. But if I'm going to use multiple user types or user roles, then this could actually mean that I'm creating multiple test cases, which is very time consuming and just not, you know, not what I would want to do. So what I'm going to use is something called parameters. So if I, for example, said login as a, um, and to initiate the to initiate the the parameter, I just basically put the at symbol, and this basically means that this is now a parameter that I can associate multiple user roles with. So I'm just going to specify user role here, and as you can see down below, what we now have. I step away is the user role parameters where I can add the user roles. Okay, so what this does is it basically removes the need to create multiple test cases for different iterations of something. And it makes it a lot quicker to, to create those test cases. Now I've just removed that step because I also want to show another um, technique in which you can actually save a lot of time. If you find yourself repeating um, different steps, what you can then do is utilize something known as a shared step. So what a shared step does is it allows you to group common um, test steps together, including parameters, um, so you can actually reuse them. Now, if you need to change anything in that test step, then it's super easy to do because um, it will then change everything all the test cases are associated to that test, to that shared step. Okay, so here is an example of the shared, um, a shared step, um, create account. All we're doing is we're going to log into customer engagement using the user role. We're going to log into the sales hub, the account, and click on a new account. That pretty much is it, but it's something that we'll use in a lot of test cases. Here, you can actually see that I now have the user role, so I'm now going to populate it. So I'm going to say sales user. Um, account manager and sales manager. Okay, now that I've saved that, I'm just going to save and close that test case. You can actually see that I've created that test case and now I can execute it. So if I execute it, what will then happen? I'm going to do run for web application after selecting this. So it will pop to the side and then basically allow me to run through it. Now going through this um, test runner, you'll be able to see that from here, I can um, click through. I can see the actual iteration. Um, so although I've created one test case, it will allow me to go through each of the tests with the different user role. Um, and also I can create a bug. I can associate it to an existing bug if I wanted to. This can be recorded. I can take pictures and I can also add comments or even record the screen with audio. So it's a really good way to then provide that full traceability. And it's also a pretty good start to automated testing because if you first of all document what you need in terms of your test cases, new descriptions and everything, then when you actually go into Easy Repro, um, you're now taking it from more manual test to your automated test. Don't forget, it is really useful to start, um, start slow, start small, 
Um, so you can make sure that that is exactly what you want. And once you've actually got everything up and running, you can then slowly start to automate things. So what I want to do is I want to go back in here and then show um, a different way of testing. So we showed is creating the test case, we utilize the parameters, and we also showed shared, shared steps. Now, what I want to do is I want to show another way of testing um, if we were going to use a Canvas app. So one of the, the things that we, we've just got, one of the new things that is in preview and has been in preview for a while, actually, is um, the Power Apps Test Studio. Now, the Power Apps Test Studio is basically a, a testing tool that's been provided to allow us to automate um, the testing of Canvas apps. So this can actually be either manually triggered or it can be added into the Azure DevOps pipeline. It is currently only available for Canvas apps at the moment. Um, and because it's in preview, it does have its limitations. I recommend having a look through just to make sure it's gonna be fit for your purpose. What I wanna do though, is I wanna show an example of how this will work. Now to show this, I've kept it really simple. I've just created a really, really simple, basic Canvas app. And what this Canvas app, Canvas app does is it just creates an account record in Dynamics 365. Okay, so going into the test studio, you'll see that it has a very similar setup, hierarchical to Azure DevOps test plans, where it starts off with a test suite. And then within that test suite, you can then have your test cases. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a new test suite. And then I'm going to create a new test case underneath that test suite. But first I need to change the name just to basically make sure that we know what the purpose of that test suite is. So similar to Azure DevOps where we actually had the requirements, we don't have that capability here, but we still need to ensure that this ties in to someone else being able to locate the test cases and understand what's being tested. Now when we create the test case, um, we change the name. And then similar again to Azure DevOps, we can enter the steps and also the expected actions. But what we're not gonna do is we're not actually gonna populate the test steps because we're going to record the screen and have um, Test Studio actually populate the test steps for us. So now I'm just gonna click on record and now this will load the Power App or the Canvas App and allow me to populate and interact with the Canvas app in order for it to identify the different clicks and the different um, and what I'm populating. And as you can see on the left, it's making a note of all the, the changes and um, the data that I'm adding. Okay. Now, once I've done that and press complete, you'll see here that that's all populated. I need to now just assert that the, um, I need to create an assert to make sure that the account has successfully been created, created in Dynamics 365. Okay, now another thing to, to confirm though is because this interacts with, um, the, with, with Power Apps, we have access to the connectors that the actual Power App is using. So although I have, pretty much hard-coded this test, you can um, make it dynamic by utilizing those different connectors and using the formula, just the same types of formulas that you would use in a standard Power App. Okay. Now, once, um, let's save this. Now, once I've saved it, it has to be published um, in order to be run. And when it, pub when, it, when it publishes, it will also publish the app itself, so that's something to note because this is now coupled with the app. Whenever we now do a deployment, this test will go with the app. So bear in mind, it is in preview, and if you do actually utilize this, then it will. It has a risk of going along into production without you knowing. So now I'm running it. You can actually see that it's running through the test steps, and it's just confirming once I press save, that the assert has been created and then we can we can finalize that. Now that's not the only thing. Um, 
we need to make sure that it's not just a fluke. So I'm going to change the, the name and just see what, what actually happens if this test fails. So I've made a change and now I'm going to publish this, um, publish the change, and then we can actually see what's going to, ha what's going to happen if the test fit, if this actual test fails. So same, same test steps. All I've did was made a change in the assert. OK, so here we have that the test has failed. Now, I'm basically running this manually. I did mention that the um, I did mention that the. This can actually be triggered from Azure DevOps. And what we can also do is we can also automatically create defects within Azure DevOps. We can also um, do other things like notify um, someone by email, create something in a SharePoint list, et cetera. Um, because Test Studio provides what's known as a, sorry, there's a question. Does that data get created in the connected environment or is it simulated? Which the data that I'm using for the test case. So the data that I'm using for the test case isn't simulated. Um, oh yeah, it actually does get connected in the environment. I understand the question now. It actually does get connected in the actual environment because all it's doing is it's just record, I'm repeating it. So here what I'm showing is the flow that I'm actually using to populate the data in Azure DevOps. And I'm using the Azure DevOps connector to create that defect. So here we have the bug that was created. And with Test Studio, we have two objects. We have um, test case result and test suite result, which provides access to the results of the test that we just had. So not only on test success, you can also have it on test failure as well. Um, but it just basically allows you to get access to the test and output it to any external system that you might want to, to push that data to or push the results to. So just in a nutshell, um, as I mentioned, we can trigger it through manually um, or schedule it through Power Automate. Um, or connected to Azure pipelines. Um, once it's been triggered, we can then save those test results either in CDS. We can trigger something through Power Automate to push it to, for example, Azure DevOps or Jira. Uh, we can even save data in SQL or send um, an email just to notify anyone of the success or failure of the test cases. So that's not that's one way of being able to automate tests for Canvas apps. It's still in preview but it should be going into GA, I think, I think fairly, fairly, fairly soon. Um, and bear in mind, it only tests Canvas apps. Now, you might have a question with regards to testing manual, um, testing, testing model-driven apps. Now, to test model-driven apps, what I would recommend is utilizing Easy Repro, which I'm going to show in a second, or utilizing a more expensive way or is use like utilizing RPA or UI flows, which I did want to set up, but I didn't have time to set up for this demo. I'm really sorry. Now, what do you automate? So when we're actually looking to automate these type these types of tests, what would you actually automate? Anything that's repetitive, I would recommend that you automate. Find yourself having to do this a lot, definitely it's going to be a time saver. Um, again, we're pointing to um, stable functionality. If you're basically going to validate that um, the code still works, aka regression testing, you might want to automate that as well. Anything that is going to affect you negatively in terms of business, if it's business critical, I would also recommend automating that. And if you have a heavy data dependency, I would also recommend that as well. Someone did ask the question, where is the data stored? The data is stored inside of the system. So it's actually making it, it's actually creating data into the system that it's connected to um, in terms of the Power App. So regression testing. Now regression testing, as I mentioned, it basically validates that the behavior is still, it still works. So this is, does it actually still work? Is the behavior after deployment um, still as we expect, as we've previously tested? 
And this is where um, manual testing or automated testing does come in handy. Now, I've already prepped a video for this. Have to add these tests into the build pipeline. I will be writing a blog about that. Sorry, give me one second. I've created a, I've created a blog. Sorry, I've created a video for this simply because with um, Easy Repro, what I've found is that it's really heavily reliant on having a good network connection. And I do, I do not have a good network connection. So my tests do tend to fail because of my network connection. So I have created a video that basically highlights how we can easily create a uh, test for Easy Repro. Now, what exactly is Easy Repro? Easy Repro is a framework to, um, a, a basically it's a testing framework, right? It's a UI testing framework that's built on top of Selenium. Um, it, it was previously written to test Dynamics 365 or CRM as it was known, but now it's being extended to test pretty much and what's known as first party model driven apps. And because it extends on top of Selenium, which is also, um, which is an open source tool, it's, it basically allows us to abstract away from needing to understand the, the model, um, the, doc, the DOM of, of Dynamics or, or, or of Microsoft or Dynamics rather. Um, so we can actually take it one step further and just basically understand the, the different methods that we need to interact with, um, to interact with the, the model instead. So here what, I'm, what we have is XRM app, which allows us to um, initialize Easy Repro to um, interact with different methods such as the login method, navigation areas, command, etc. And we also have the web client which allows us to interact with the, the browser. So there we are specifying that the browser type is Chrome, that we're going to in initiate in private mode. But on top of that, there are additional objects that were added after because there has been a release um, that um, a release in June, I believe. So there was a new release added in June. Okay, so now that we're, as you can see here, what we're doing is we're pretty much replicating the same test steps that we had in the manual test that we created earlier. So we're browsing this to the Sales Hub app, then we're going to navigate to the account in sales, then open the account form, and then um, populate it, save it, and then validate it. Okay, so Easy Repro is available on GitHub. It has over 200 different sample codes to be used that shows you how to interact with the different screens, the different controls, etc. So if you are interested in getting started with Easy Repro, I really highly recommend going to GitHub and basically just getting stuck in. Um, another thing as well that we can do is for proof, because a lot of the times when we utilize tests, you actually need to pretty much prove that you have tested. And because of that, we can take screenshots or we can even record video um, to provide that proof. OK, so. I did mention that um, we do have the sample codes here. I'm basically specifying the name. Um, I'm populating the name entity, um, name attribute. So what we can do is we have different, obviously different types of attributes, lookup, date controls, option sets, et cetera, each with different syntax. Um, and all those syntax you'll be able to find in the, in the sample code as well. Okay. Now I did mention that um, this is one way. The other way is by using um, UI flows. Now, UI flows are, are also based on Selenium at the moment. Um, so it will have a very similar experience um, without code. So it's more of a, a low code way of doing what's happening now. Another really useful thing to know is that the Sorry, I lost my train of thought. But another really useful thing to know is that um, with Easy Repro, we can then also link this to Azure DevOps pipelines, which I believe 
is going to be valuable to show the quality of the test and the history of the test. And I'm actually going to show what that looks like after this setup as well. So once we've actually created the test, what does it actually look like when we execute it? So to execute the test, what we're going to do is we're going to run it. Now, there are two ways in which we can run um, the model-driven app. We can run it um, via, we can run it with in headless mode, which means that it does appear on the screen and you can follow it through. Um, alternatively, we can run it in, um, in a headless mode, which basically means that it runs in the background. Um, this is something that's been introduced to Easier Pro fairly recently and will be set up in the browser options that we saw in the previous screen. So as you can see, what this is doing is going through the different steps that we had. First of all, it was the login, and then now it's going to the sales hub. Then it's going to go to the account, create a new account, and then go back to the account and open the first record in the grid. Okay. Now, if it does fail, what it will do is it will, at the moment, it, with, if you don't have it linked to Azure DevOps, it will just you know, fail and you'll be able to see it in vis Visual Studio. But I don't believe that's going to be obviously adequate enough because we want to know um, in, in Visual Studio the quality of the test if the requirement or the feature that we have is fully tested and failing. So highly recommend it to link it back to Azure DevOps. And I'm going to be sharing some resources that will direct you as to how to do this because I didn't actually um, take a video of that. So. Once we've actually done that, what we can then do, as I mentioned, linking it to um, linking it to DevOps um, is pretty much what I've done is I've extended the manual test. So this is actually the, the old manual test I had, and I linked it to my automated test. So I now have two different ways of executing this test. I can automate it, or I can actually run, run it manually if I chose to. Okay, so with this, I can see that the test has passed and that's great. But what happens if the test fails? Well, with that, I'm just gonna go to a previous test that failed. And then I can see the test history. So the test run history. So you can actually see when, at what point the test failed. And then I can actually see why the test failed. So I can go into it and just view why the test failed. Now, because I can see that the test failed, I can triage it to understand what actually happened. And I can then update, um, I can see the history rather, um, see when it started to fail and if it started to work again, and then triage it, update, um, update the analysis, create defects, et cetera. And this, all of this is basically then going to allow me to do reporting with an ADO to ensure that I do have decent quality. Okay. So let's just recap. So testing, testing produces quality. So it's not, it's not enough to just obviously have pipelines. Pipelines are great. Um, but we also need to ensure that what we are doing is what we need to do. So requirements all the way through to the build, all the way through to um, testing, they all need to be pretty much tested. Um, but when we actually do manual testing, there is a misnomer that it takes so much time. It does not need to be labor intensive. You can simplify it. You can utilize things like parameters, um, shared steps, etc. And there are others as well. Um, you, should, you should test soon and you should test often. You should test as soon as you can, starting from those requirements. And also utilize different techniques in order to ensure that you're keeping your code clean and you're keeping your um, actual tested requirements or features um, up, up to standard as well. Utilizing regression testing tools such as Easy Repro, Test Studio, and hopefully I'll be able to share on my blog soon, RPA or UI flows. So some reading material. Um, obviously we do have Will Hamsey. Will Hamsey has actually written a blog 
on Easy Repro. It is slightly out of date, but we do have Benedict Bergman, who's written a more recent blog. Together, they're really useful. And also, I'm going to be writing some blogs as well on it, um, especially using SpecFlow um, to show how we can also integrate it with a more business-driven development um, approach. And um, we have Jordi, um, who will be able to take us through, and he has already taken us through, how we can use, utilize his tool for more unit testing and integration testing. And we also have videos showing how to do this. Um, so someone asked a question in terms of how to set it up. Mohammed Radwan has actually created a video showing the step-by-step -step process of how to actually do it, as well as Alex Schlega. So I would recommend watching those two videos um, that will direct you as to how to do it. OK, now, are there any other questions? First of all, thank you, Trisha. I'm really good, you know, covering all the different test uh, testing uh, frameworks out there. Um, I think the first question is someone's asking, could you uh, copy and paste your uh, those links um, into the chat? Yeah, um, that, that would be helpful for uh, Sabjan. He's asking for for those links and so is Govinda. <clears throat> um, and um, one question is asking um, by Dash is asking, is it possible to add easy repro as gated check-ins in Azure DevOps? Yes, it is. So just like how you would add um, your unit testing as gated check-ins, it's a very similar process because when you create an easy repro test, you create a unit test. It's still a unit test. So the same steps that you would need to execute those unit tests for gated check-ins, it's actually the exact same process to run these as well. And SM is asking how to add these tests into build pipeline. Again, to be honest, it's the same answer. It's, it, don't treat these tests as something so different. I think a lot of people get um, caught up with the different names and different terminology. Yes, you will have to have um, different, um, you'll have to have like different code, different syntax, different modules, etc. But at the end of the day, you're still just creating a unit test. Um, it's just doing something different. Daniel Staniforth is asking, does the data get created in the connected environment or is it simulated? So if it gets connected to the same environment, or it gets created in the same environment that you've got the Canvas app connected to. So in my example, I had um, I was creating an account in a Dynamics 365 instance. So when that test is recorded and replayed, all it's doing is mimicking it and it's going to re it's going to create a new test in the same dynamics instance which means it is better to have a dynamic um, uh, population of test data because then you're looking at duplicate data in that same system spot on uh, Trisha. and uh, philip's asking do you know if easy repro tests run in parallel or they run one after the other, especially in a pipeline, conscious of the time it takes for the runs to complete. Yeah, it does run one after the other. It does run one after the other, which is why um, it is not advisable. It's, it's not something that you should do lightly. Um, there, is, there are different tests for different, um, the different testing techniques for for different areas. So this is more at the tip of the iceberg where you just need to validate something that already has been validated or is really business critical, um, or it could be something that is superbly, you know, very complex or um, you need a lot of data for. So you're not, you shouldn't be expecting a lot of um, tests of these types. You shouldn't be expecting a lot of automated UI tests. Um, what you what you should do if you what you should do you should actually have a lot more unit tests than automated UI tests automated UI unit tests and then system tests and then automated UI tests. And Fam is asking, does Easy Repro support .NET Core now? Not to my knowledge. It's and, on, and, and on that topic, um, Trisha, it's interesting that you mentioned about the spec flow um, because that's uh, that's uh, I've seen some new extensions available for spec flow integration with um, with Easy Repro. Yeah, so it has actually been um, integratable for a good while. 
Um, and it, it's really, really useful because that then breaks the silo between functional and um, developers and testers because you're validating now that um, that what you're building, what your tests are, are what the business actually wants and because it's written in a particular syntax. So if you are interested, I'm actually going to be um, writing about that on my blog um, within the next two to three weeks. So just keep an eye on it. Um, I'll also share my blog details in the chat along with the links. Excellent. And Jack Murphy, a big fan of yours, uh, saying great session, Trisha. Great session. Thank you. And Daniel Staniforth is saying, um, can you delete the tests from the canvas? So for deployment, so have a build version with the tests, then a deployment copy that you can delete the tests so that they do not get deployed to prod. Would that be the recommended approach? Well, I would not be utilizing Test Studio in production. The, the, the trick is, and what, I, what I'm personally concerned about is with Test Studio, because it's coupled with the test, with the app, if you deploy the app to another environment, you're also deploying Test Studio and the tests. Um, you're not deploying the data, you're deploying the test, which means that if I publish the app, then I'm also publishing the test. Do you see what I mean? So it's it's something you have to be careful with. Does that answer Def your question? Definitely, yeah. So so Romy um, is saying thanks, Trisha, um, for the great session. And Xavier is also saying thanks. Uh, Srinath is also saying thanks. That's a solid session. Sabjan Sama is asking, are there any known bugs with UCI first party apps while testing through Easy Repro? I have seen some in the past um, later summer. Yeah, to be honest, I won't lie. There, there, there does tend to be a lot of bugs, but to be honest, remember this is open source and um, although it's open source, it's still being maintained by Microsoft. Um, they do have a full team on it and it's constantly um, being updated because they still have to keep up with the changes that are being made on the Power Platform. Um, so it, with each fix becomes one or two bugs. But if variably what I've experienced is if I do have a defect, I can look through the issues other people are experiencing, they're sharing either their workarounds or even how they fix it. I can actually also then um, take the, the necessary release that will allow me to just move on. So I recommend getting involved in the, that GitHub community um, so you can actually, you know, get your things fixed quickly as well. So thanks again, Trisha. Um, in terms of questions, um, I'm not sure if there's any more questions here. Um, if anybody does have any questions, um, we do have about five to ten minutes. Uh, feel free to uh, unmute your mic and please, please, please follow Trisha. Uh, Trisha, if you could just share your uh, contact details so that people know how to connect with you, that would be really great. I will. I'll, I'll do it in the chat right after this session. So Leo is asking... How hard to make Easy Repro work against an on-prem D365? It they do have. Um, so I mentioned the sample code. They also still have previous versions um, that will allow you to to connect to on-prem. I haven't obviously tested that um, in recent years, um, but you they do still have it on the website. What I recommend, Leo, is having a look. I will share the I will share the links, and there is a link to the GitHub site there as well. Um, and if you want to contact me, you can ping me, and I can show you directly where to go for the on-prem version of it. So Kennedy um, is asking, how do you validate whether the test case has covered the acceptance criteria of the requirement? This is where Specflow really comes into use because with Specflow, you're you're writing it. In that, in in a way that the business user valid has validated it, so it's written in a, as a, I want to, so that um, given then, um, and because of that, the test cases act or the test cases actually match up to that. Um, so when you're running it through, you can actually see the area that's actually being tested. 
Um, with without spec flow, though, I will admit it is, in my opinion, a bit through experience. And that's one of the things, the drawbacks of regression or automated UI tests. People think that if they have automated UI tests, it's the answer to the world, and it's not, because the test could be validating something totally different to what was originally intended. So you do need to be careful with that. Excellent. So yes, so I think um, in terms of questions and answers, um, I think I think we have them. Uh, I think uh, Malol Poe is asking, is saying thank you, Tricia. Uh, again, big thanks from Leo. Uh, Rafael Pereira is saying really amazing session. Thank you very much, Tricia. Um, so yes, you did cover quite a lot there, Tricia. So once again, thanks. Uh, thanks again. Thank you very much for um, for, for your session. I think it's very important to uh, remember to connect with Tricia. Um, Trisha, are you able to share your, your connection details uh, or shall we um, add them into the chat window? Oh, there we go, yeah, yeah so we can I'll, see them, yeah. I'll add them in. I'll stop sharing so I don't blast you with everything. And then I'll share my, I'll share my email, the links now. So those are my contact details.